Let's do this thing. As you probably figured out, I'm Mark Lipsy, and my assigned topic here is interpreting the practical significance of meta-analysis findings. Um, it's probably not appropriate to build this as a training, despite the fact that it's part of the Campbell Collaboration training package, because there's no real structure around this topic. There are no good articles, there are no books, there are no book chapters, there's really not any content uh, I could draw on in any very systematic way to turn into a training. So what we're going to have is musings on the topic of interpreting practical significance. Uh, and this is something I've been thinking about quite a while, particularly around the issue of the statistical effect sizes that we produce and do they really mean anything to anybody in the form in which we produce them in a formal meta-analysis. So I want to talk about that and some uh, uh, related issues and uh, we'll see where we go. Um, particularly though, um, what I have in mind is not so much that any of the specific things that we look at or talk about in this context will necessarily be broadly applicable or even useful for you. Some may be, some may be not. What really I think is important here is a um, a, a mindset, a way of thinking about these things, of recognizing that what we produce is in research synthesis, at least in the quantitative uh, versions of it, is not automatically intelligible to anybody who's trying to make sense of the practical or the uh, policy implications. And we need to accept the responsibility and the burden of figuring out how to translate it. And depending on the context and the nature of the information and the audience and so on, there would be many different ways ways to uh, do that. The more important thing is to have the idea of doing it, have some notions of how that might be done, which I'll try and give you some food for thought along those lines, uh, and then to sort of open that uh, creative window when the opportunity um, ar arises to see what you can do with your audiences and, uh, and your material, okay? <laughs> Uh, so those, those are most of my disclaimers. I'll probably have a few more as, uh, as we go along. Um, so since this is mostly musings, um, let me encourage you to uh, interrupt and distract me as freely as you like and are able. So I would encourage at any point if you have questions or comments to uh, jump in. Um, Remind me if I don't remember that I'm supposed to repeat anything you say for posterity. Be careful what you say uh, and be especially careful with how I paraphrase it. Um, uh, um, so we will need to do that because we're because of the the, the attempt to uh, uh, capture this momentous occasion for uh, uh, posting on the uh, Campbell website for the edification of future generations to come for who knows how long. Uh, so, um, uh, with that in mind, um, here's the problem as I see it. Um, these effect size statistics that we routinely generate in research synthesis on intervention studies by themselves provide little insight into the nature and magnitude uh, or the practical significance of the effects they represent. Um, um, and the audiences we really want to communicate with in research synthesis, especially in the context of the Campbell collaboration, the practitioners, the policy makers, those who would use the distilled results of the research that we synthesize, have even less ability to interpret things in that sort of native uh, uh, form. Um, so for example, we find the mean standardized mean difference effect size this is the common Cohen's D, Hedges G. For educational interventions with middle school students on a standardized reading test is about 0.15 and statistically significant. Everybody got that? <laughs> so what? Seems kind of small, 0.15. Okay, is that large enough to have practical significance for improving the reading skills of these middle school students? And here's really the bottom line, which is we don't know on the basis of that number. 
okay? And this is really important to have in mind. There's no necessary relationship between the numerical magnitude of these summary statistics that we use in research synthesis and the practical or policy significance. And that can go both ways. You can have very small numbers that have very large practical and policy significance, and you can have large numbers that have fairly trivial implications for practice and policy. The, the corollary of that is that we need some bridge if those numerical values don't have any direct meaning, we need some bridge between those numerical values and the world of practice and policy. So, on that thought, let me just try and get rid of the most common misunderstanding and misleading interpretation of the numerical values of statistical effect sizes since I just said that they have no inherent uh, uh, practical significance. And this is the famous Jacob Cohen, small, medium, large, 0.20 is small, the one I just showed you, 0.15 is even smaller than that. Can you just dismiss that then? It's smaller than small and obviously not useful. I'm gonna show you a little bit later that it's not at all uh, trivial uh, in its context. Um, this, these are, this is so widely used as a frame of reference that it's, um, I, that we, we, just, we just have to address it. Um, some of you, I'm sure, actually know the origins of this and have spent time with Jacob Cohen's uh, book on statistical power analysis, but I would guess it was not bedside reading for a lot of you. Um, where did this come from? Jacob Cohen is, was developing a frame for power analysis, which is what sample size do you need in order to detect a particular effect so, for planning purposes in research? Well, in order to illustrate how this unfolded, and he did just seminal work in this area, okay, hugely important to the field. But to provide examples of how this works, he has to say, well, suppose you're trying to detect an effect size of this or that or the other. And he builds his tables around these and shows you how it all works. Where does he get small, medium, and large? Out of blue sky, okay? He leans back. This is the way I imagine it, okay? <laughs> He leans back in his armchair. He says, I'm a distinguished professor with an extensive experience in the social and behavioral sciences. I've seen a lot of research. 0.20 seems kind of small end of the distribution to me. 0.5 is about the middle, and 0.8 is kind of the large. So I'll use those as sort of little benchmarks here for my examples. Now, what he's doing in an impressionistic way is something important, and I'm going to come back to it. He's, he's trying to look at these things in a sort of a normative sense. You know, what's the distribution of what's out there, and where are you on that distribution? That's not a bad idea. And I'm going to come back to that uh, concept a, a little bit later. The issue here is what is the appropriate distribution? If you're looking at educational interventions in a particular context on broadband achievement measures, is the right, if you want to do a normative comparison with what kind of effect sizes are out there, is the right distribution everything that Jacob Cohen is aware of that has happened in the world of social and behavioral interventions? Probably not. And there's good reason to believe that these effect size distributions from interventions vary enormously depending on what kind of outcome measure, what kind of context, what kind of intervention. So it's not the normative concept that's so bad here. It's the idea that there's some universal norm that you can use to characterize any kind of effect size that comes out of any meta-analysis. All right? Are we okay with that? Nobody leaves this room whoever makes reference to small, medium, and large effect sizes without contextualizing it, okay? There'll be a little waiver form that you will have to sign here before you go, all right? Or, okay, so, um, so getting into some frameworks here that will help us think about this in, uh, in a little more systematic and appropriate, I think, form. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna give an overview of sort of what I think are categorically the, the, the two approaches. Um, and maybe there are more, but remember, these are my musings. You're welcome to contribute your own at any point. Um, but I think the big categories here are first, what I would simply call descriptive representations, okay? These are just translations, all right? Translations of these numer numerical values into forms that allow you at least to have a better intuition 
of what they mean. I mean, what does 0.15 standard deviations on a given measure mean, okay? If we could just turn that number, just simply transform it into something that, to, that we could get a better grasp on. A, a percentages, for instance, we have a better comprehension of what a percentage means than a standard deviation unit, okay? Um, so one, one thing, fairly simple thing to do, straightforward, though there are many variations on this, um, is to just think of some descriptive analog transformation of what your, uh, uh, what your review produces in the way of summary effect sizes that has a little more intuitive appeal. So I want to go through some examples of, uh, of how you might do that in, uh, in different situations, some of which might be useful for application for you. Um, the other component, though, the other, uh, the other approach, uh, which is really um, it really gets more to the heart of the matter here, but is more difficult to do, is to actually try and make some direct assessment of the practical significance of that numerical finding that comes out of a systematic review. Um, and what makes this challenging is that it requires a bridge. It requires some criteria. It requires something that connects the numerical statistical world of, of meta-analysis Within, with some criterion framework or some standards or some practical context. And there are different kinds of bridges. I'll give you some examples. There's probably many, many possibilities when you're thinking that way. But, but, the, but the basic fact again here is that the numerical values, even when transformed into ways that give you a better in, intuitive understanding, of what they might mean uh, and, and their magnitude and their practical significance is still only an intuitive understanding. If we're actually then going to make a more direct connection with practical significance, we need some context, some criteria, some framework of the actual practical significance that we can connect to uh, uh, the, the magnitude of the effect sizes. Are you following me? And I'll give you some, a couple of examples of, um, in fact, the Jacob Cohen concept of norms indexing against what other people have found with similar interventions, and are you on the little end or the big end or the uh, medium end, for instance, would be, be getting you into a context, uh, into a, a framework that was actually drawn from the appropriate uh, uh, context and falls in this category. And there are a couple of other things that are worth thinking about. Um, but remember, this is not my laundry list of things to do. These are brain teasers to kind of get you thinking about what the possibilities might be, because most of this, I think, needs to be very much contextualized. The nature of the intervention, uh, the nature of the outcomes and the outcome measures that are at issue, the nature of the audience you're trying to communicate, and the purposes with which you think this information will be used. There's, there's, there's no simple way to do this. It, uh, it's, it's going to be very much a function of context. Okay, so far? You okay, John? Yes. All right. <laughs> okay, so let me, uh, uh, let me just um, spend a little time on what I have found to be some useful um, descriptive representations of intervention effect sizes. And, and there's almost certainly something in this broad family that would apply in any meta-analytic uh, context. Um, so the, the easiest thing you can do down this pathway is when you do your synthesis and kind of come to your numerical conclusions is to add another paragraph in which you tell the reader what this might mean in some other terminology other than standard deviation units or odds ratios or risk ratios or something like that, okay? Um, this should be accessible in virtually, uh, uh, virtually every case the more challenging direct assessment of practical uh, uh, significance uh, uh, it may not always be so easy. Um, so uh, to, to kind of start at the easy end, um, often simply a back translation into the original metric or one of the original metrics that's in the mix of outcome measures that are involved in your uh, synthesis um, may be very appropriate if all or some of those are not in arbitrary units. If the original metric is uh, achievement test measures that are fairly arbitrary, what does uh, 190.5 mean on the, uh, on the, uh, on the SAT 10 um, reading achievement measure? Who knows? But if we're talking about days of hospitalization or we're talking about wages or we're talking about um, uh, uh, how many juvenile offenders are arrested after intervention, um, 
Uh, those, are, those are meaningful metrics. We typically, because there'll be variation in those kinds of measures, we typically transform into, in, them into effect sizes for standardization and do our analysis there, but to back translate often uh, uh, that simple step. And maybe not all of the measures come in that form. The reason we went to standardized effect sizes is different people are using different measures and so on, but maybe there's a particularly common one or a particularly representative one. Let's back translate into that one and at least people can see uh, uh, what's going on. So uh, let me give you an example from my own experience. Um, a, um, a, a mean phi coefficient for the effects of intervention on the reoffense rates of juvenile offenders. The phi coefficient is the correlation Essentially, the correlation you get if you take a dichotomy for treatment and control and a dichotomy for arrested or not arrested or dead or alive or any binary outcome, you take that little two-by-two two table and you essentially compute the product moment correlation with those funny zero and one numbers and you get, um, you, you get this uh, phi coefficient, which is an, an, an effect size that is in the same family as odds ratios and risk ratios and other things for uh, binary outcomes, okay? Um, uh, in fact, it looks like that, okay? There's a two-by-two two table. Um, the A, B, C, Ds there are sort of your standard notation for a two-by-two two table. And then uh, across the treatment row, we have a probability of being in the first cell and one minus that of being in the second cell. So we have, in this case, reoffend, don't reoffend. Uh, and the phi coefficient, uh, there's a little formula down there, okay, for how you compute it from a two-by-two two table. Everybody got that? This will be on the exam. <laughs> okay. Um, now, here, here was the situation I actually encountered some years ago. There was a paper written in the area of interventions with juvenile offenders. This is an area in which I've done a lot of work, okay? Uh, and this paper used, uh, did a systematic review, a meta-analysis of a sort, um, and, uh, and used the phi coefficient as the effect size. No problem with that, okay? Um, but the conclusion, the, 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 the interpretation the authors put on that is that this is basically a correlation coefficient. A correlation of 0.2 is pretty small, is pretty trivial. So they set the standard of 0.2, okay? If there was not a phi coefficient above 0.2, the presumption was this was an ineffective intervention, having such trivial effects uh, that it wasn't worthy of consideration. They did their systematic review, relatively few of the, um, of the phi coefficients were above 0.2. They concluded that this research shows that uh, that there are essentially no effects of intervention with juvenile offenders, or they're so small, for the most part, they're fairly trivial. Okay? You see what's happening numerically here. You have a kind of an image of correlations ranging from zero to one. Point two in many contexts in social behavioral sciences is pretty small relationship. Okay? So, at one level, it's not so bizarre to say, that looks pretty small, we'll just call that uh, trivial. Okay? But let's just do a little translation for what that might mean, a little back translation here to the original metric. Uh, so a very, common, um, a, 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 a very common metric in this literature is the reoffense rates uh, measured by arrest reoffenses over a six month or 12 month period. Okay, so we pick a, a, a six month period, for instance. Um, we go through the research studies uh, that are involved and we look at the control groups and just see what, at least for those that use this particular metric, what's the average recidivism rate? And it turns out to be 0 0.50. Okay, so with a little bit of algebra and the formula I just uh, uh, showed you, um, you can actually figure out what the proportions have to be, okay? So we have a two by two table, you have 0.5 and 0.5 for the control group. Now you can figure out, I actually put this in a little spreadsheet and did it by trial and error um, because it's been so long since I took algebra, I thought that'd be faster than, so, than solving the equation, but you can go either way. You can figure out what the proportions need to be in, uh, on average in the treatment group to, uh, uh, to reflect that. And, uh, and what you get is a 30% um, failure rate in the average treatment for a 0.20 and a 70% uh, uh, success rate 
compared to 50-50 in the control groups. Um, this is on a, 50, on a 0 0.50 baseline value, this is a 40% reduction in the reoffense rate of offenders with a, with a phi coefficient of 0.2 as the effect size. I've worked with juvenile justice systems for decades now. Most of them would kill is not the right metaphor here. <laughs> okay. Uh, but, 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 but that is in the, in, the, in the practical world. If I offered a, a way to reduce reoffense rates by 40%, I'd be the most popular guy in the world of juvenile justice systems. Okay. Are you following me? All right. So, the, so I want you to see two things. First, 0.2 followed up as a correlation coefficient sounds trivial. So it wasn't so crazy for these people to say, we'll just call that the threshold and below that it's not meaningful. But they didn't go the other step to say, what does that actually look like in terms of the context we're talking about in the phenomenon? And then the second thing here is a simple back translation to one representative type of measure, which is re-offense rates over, uh, re-arrest offense rates over a six month period with the control groups that for which that metric was used in these studies being about 0.5. A little bit of algebra tells me now, same number, same number, okay? We haven't gone to any other world here. We just translated that number into something we can get a better grasp on, and when we do that, it stops looking like it's small and trivial. In fact, on the contrary, that looks pretty huge, okay? Sometime when we're not on camera, I'll tell you the story of um, my conversations with the authors of this paper around this particular issue, but that's for another time. Here's another example with, um, uh, with standardized uh, tests, okay? So suppose that we have a, means, a standardized mean difference, okay? So now we're talking about the D or you know, Hedges G kind of effect size, not a, a correlation coefficient, uh, for interventions on a vocabulary test of 0 0.30. Now, if you get yourself into the Cohen mindset, oh, gee, this is barely bigger than small, can't be much going on uh, here. Um, uh, we look at this uh, literature, and the, um, and the most frequently used measure of vocabulary is the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test, um, PPVT, okay? Others are used, other vocabulary tests, but that's a widely used one, so we can think of that as a very familiar one in this domain. And besides that, I'm located at uh, Peabody College where it was invented, so we're just real fond of this particular vocabulary <laughs> test. You can't imagine the royalties that come into the college from this. Uh, um, so if, you, uh, if you're doing any of this work, PPVT, good measure. Um, this is a normed test, okay? So it produces results in arbitrary raw score units, okay? But it's a norm test, it's, it's widely used, so there's a substantial norming population here. Um, it has a norm standard score of 100, uh, standard deviation of 15. So we can take our 0 0.30 effect size, which is in standard deviation units, and we can talk about what that looks like relative to the national norms that have come out of the uh, norm test. And that basically tells us that what we're seeing in the uh, control groups, um, or, or I, I'm sorry, uh, we, we then look at the control groups, okay, that uh, in the studies that use the PPVT um, have to take a look to make sure that that's relatively representative and the ones that use the PPVT aren't different in some major way from the ones who didn't, okay? We can look at those control groups. We can look at the, um, uh, at the PPVT um, uh, baseline scores there. Actually, I think this is outcome. And we find, say, that the mean standard score on that is 0.87. So how much improvement in that standard score do we get out of an effect size of, uh, of 0.30? Well, again, a little bit of algebra tells us that, um, that what this translates into is a, um, is a, a standard score of 91.5, okay? So our 0 .30 is equivalent to moving students from an average score of, 0 .87, of, of 87 to 91.5, okay? Now, this might not mean much to you, but for a particular audience that's very familiar with these measures and very familiar with the concept of standard scores, 
a population average of 100 and, and variation in a, in a school counselor context, for instance, uh, uh, where they use these things all the time. The difference between 87 and 91.5 is something they can get a better grasp on than a 0 0.30. And furthermore, since we know the population uh, the norm population is 100, we're seeing how far we have gone in closing the performance gap between the, uh, between the target uh, uh, kids who receive this program and the average for the national norms. Are you following me here? Okay. I mean, this is not particularly profound, but, but this is much easier to talk about in practical context than a 0 .30 standardized mean difference effect size. Yeah, Gary. Yeah, 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 Gary wants to translate these into percentiles, which is going to be a really good segue into my next example. <laughs> Anything else? What can you do if you don't have the standard deviation? Is there a way to translate it from the increment effect sizes? You could possibly, um, depending on the on the circumstance. I mean, the the, the under, underlying logic of these two um, of these two situations is that we find um, a set of control groups because uh, we're asking how much improvement there is over what the uh, control uh, group shows. We, we 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 find control groups and we translate the difference into something that tells us how much better in in some metric that we can can better comprehend how much better the average treatment group is than the, uh, the average control group. Depending on what that metric is and how interpretable it is, you would, you would get there in different ways. You know, this is normed with the standard deviation of 0.15. We might actually have standard deviation values from these studies that use the PPVT. It's possible in this population that um, uh, that, that normed, um, well, I shouldn't say that. Um, I mean, the, the concept of the norm, I'm, the concept of the norm is it's a transformation. You know, you transform everything to 0.15, but the, but the actual standard scores in this sample might not actually have a standard deviation of uh, 0.15, so uh, of 1, 5, uh, 15, sorry. Um, so, we might, um, uh, so we might actually get a somewhat better picture of what's going on in our sample um, by, um, uh, by, by computing the standard scores with the actual st standard deviation that, um, uh, in, in, in our sample than with the uh, presumptive uh, uh, national norm. But that'd be something to think about in terms of what your data were and, and what meaning you want to sort of uh, uh, highlight in, in, uh, in what you're extracting here. Okay, so Gary, we could think about intervention effect sizes as being represented as percentiles in a normal distribution. And there are many contexts in which the idea of percentile scores uh, on this kind of a distribution mean more than standardized mean effect sizes. So here, for instance, is an example uh, assuming um, that we have scores that are normally uh, distributed. Um, and there are situations where that's not a good assumption, but I would point out as a sort of footnote, um, with rare exceptions, the research literature we're including in our um, in our syntheses, study by study, are typically assuming normal distributions. Um, if they use standard statistics, implicit in the standard statistics uh, is the assumption of, uh, of normally uh, distributed uh, scores, unless they give you heterogeneity tests or, or use special statistics for skewed distributions. So we're not going very far away as a meta-analyst to say, okay, let's think about these as being uh, normally distributed. Here's an effect size of 0.73 standard deviation uh, units uh, uh, between a, a, a sort of a standardized uh, control group distribution and treatment group distribution. And the, um, the percentile for the control group, the mean of the control group is at the 50 50th percentile, right? If it's a symmetrical distribution, then half of them are going to be on each side, so that's going to be the 50th percentile point. Translating our 0.73 standard deviation unit effect size, um, and why is that 
Um, in my world, that's a knock your socks off kind of uh, effect size. Um, but if it were any smaller, these distributions would be so close together, you wouldn't even be able to see what the point was. Um, but if we take that and, uh, and, and simply work with uh, any chart of the area under the normal curve, it's fairly simple to turn that into percentiles and say relative to a 50 percentile control group uh, level that's just a sort of a more or less arbitrary standard because it's always going to be 50 percent in a symmetrical uh, distribution. How much, um, uh, uh, what now is the percentile for the average, um, uh, the average for the intervention uh, distribution? So moving in many contexts, you know, um, moving the average from 50 percentile to 77 percentile, up 27 percentile points, is, is going to be more interpretable than an effect size of 0.73. And um, it's fairly easy to get there um, with, uh, uh, with any table you can pull them off the web uh, at will. They're in the back of statistics books of the area under the uh, normal curve. And I just pulled out the handiest table I had and, and blew it up to show you what we're doing here. Here's the, um, that, yeah, that shows up. Here's the, uh, uh, here are the z-scores. And since it's symmetrical, you know, you z, z at zero is the middle of the distribution. And then they get, they move in standard deviation units, positive on one side, negative on the other. But since it's symmetrical, you don't really have to have the negatives. It's the same proportion under the curve, uh, whichever way you go. So at the zero point, we've got 50 in, on one side and the tail Whichever direction you want to think about the tail going has 50 in it. Okay, so there's our 50, 50, uh, there's our 50th percentile. So remember, we have an effect size of 0.73. So we go down this table, well off the page, way up here, well off the page, and we get to the z-score of 0.73 because the z-score is standard deviation units. You know, so what's a um, uh, what's a 0.73 standard deviation uh, from uh, from zero? And the breakdown we get is uh, is right there, and the part that we're interested in. Um, since we're going on the positive side uh, with our intervention group, uh, has 77% of the distribution under there. There's our percentile score. Okay? And not only is this a percentile score, but given what percentiles mean, it's telling us that, um, that if we start out with a, a distribution and we move the mean up and we think about, and I'll get to a more systematic version of this in a moment, if we think about that mean on the control group, okay, with its 50-50 split, we have moved 27% of the kids into the top half of this scoring range, all right, whereas before we only had 50% in that range. It's easier to get your head around how much improvement that is than a standardized mean difference effect size of 0.73 standard deviations, right? Not any worse, anyway. You've got to grant that much, all right? Um, this is actually, um, back to Jacob Cohen again, um, uh, this is actually something he, it, in the context of interpreting these effect size issues, he's got a whole virtually chapter on the idea of overlapping distributions. And he comes up with various indices. What uh, this overlapping, this proportion above the control group mean is actually something Cohen called with, the, uh, with a catchy title of U3. Um, there was U1 and U2, and they're not really very interesting, and neither is U4, um, but, that, but U3 is actually very useful. This reminds, I, I shouldn't tell this, but this reminds me of this old, old vaudeville story, not so old, but about those of you in the U.S. know 7-Up, the poor guy who invented 1-Up, 2-Up, 3-Up, 4-Up, 5-Up, 6-Up, and then just gave up. <laughs> Well, U3 is really uh, is worth getting to. U1 and U2 aren't that exciting. Um, but there are little charts for these things, but they basically come out of the normal distributions, so you can do them for, uh, um, uh, for whatever you want. But it does sort of give you some idea of uh, what these effect sizes mean in terms of overlapping distributions. So effect sizes around 0.10, standardized mean differences, are essentially moving 4% of, uh, of the uh, intervention group above that mean on the uh, control group. You get up into the range of 50, and you got about close to 20% who, who, are, who are being moved up into the high end of the, uh, that original distribution. And you get effect sizes, uh, you should be lucky enough to see one, um, in the range of 1.0 and you've got more than a third of the cases that are now moved from, uh, uh, from below the average to above the average for whatever it is you're measuring. Okay? 
Everybody okay with what we're doing here? Simple transformations. None of this is very profound. Okay, these are the descriptive transformations. The idea is that with a little bit of work in the context and thinking about what these things actually mean in different ways to represent them, we can give readers and, and, um, and those who might use research synthesis a description of what our basic numbers that we have to use for purposes of, of a meta-analysis because of their standardized nature in our own statistical models. We can give a, a descriptive transformation of those that at least is going to be easier in some context for people to get their heads around and have a better appreciation of what it might mean. Yeah. Why, Good. Why haven't we done that? What's the risk? Is there a risk of misinterpretation by maybe picking the wrong metric? Oh. Yeah, so the question is why haven't we done this? And I think the answer is um, uh, the, the answer is research culture and norms. I don't think it's that there's any obvious kind of downside. I mean, certainly a critic could look at what you've done and, and say, oh, I don't think that's a good transformation. But if you're doing research, quantitative research in a statistical framework, the critic can look at anything you've done and say, you know, I don't really think that was the best way to do it. So that's not a, a I, I really think it's more a normative thing. Um, I, I, have, I have talked on this topic, uh, in, in fact we did a, uh, some of you might be interested, uh, we did a, um, a methods guide for the U.S. Department of Education on this issue with educational outcomes for primary studies, not for meta-analysis. And the same thing occurs in primary studies. You know, you do a treatment, we're talking about intervention studies, you know, you do a, a treatment control comparison on outcomes, and, you know, and you have to analyze those, you know, you have a multiple regression, you have a t-test, you have an analysis of variance. The native statistical form that is inherent in that kind of research is the mean for the treatment group and the mean for the control group and, you know, and a p-value and maybe an effect size if someone tosses that in. That's just the way we report stuff. In the research technical world, it's moderately meaningful. I say moderately because, frankly, I think if we sat even experienced researchers down and gave them some of these numbers and asked them to tell us what, it, what they actually meant in the real world, that they would, uh, they would struggle with that. But it's not common even to translate our primary, you know, what, right. what does this mean in terms of percentiles or descriptive difference or magnitude? Uh, stopping a step short that, finishing the job. Say that again. We have been <laughs> stopping a step short of finishing the job. I like that. <laughs> I think that's exactly right. And not for any fundamental reasons that, that, it's, that it's a silly thing to do or that I really think it's just, you know, you grow up doing research the way your father did research or your mother or your grandmother or <laughs> your mentors or, you know, what's in the textbooks. And it just hasn't been part of the, the culture to think about that next step. Um, but in the world of intervention research, okay, which is where we're really thinking both primary studies and, um, and, and synthesis, at least in a Campbell collaboration uh, uh, context. Intervention research is about the effects of interventions. And for the most part, uh, or, or for a very large category of that kind of research, there's some theoretical work and some laboratory work, it's about interventions that matter in the real world, okay? Becomes particularly important to take that next step when you're dealing with something that uh, matters and not something that's just of theoretical interest or only of interest to uh, other researchers in your field. Yes, ma'am. I'm new to your collaboration, but I was wondering, do you do plain language with your reviews? Uh, we, we, we do, and we have, uh, um, um, do we do plain language in the Campbell reviews? Um, in concept, yes. How plain that language is when it comes from the researchers who have the technical skills to do a good synthesis is something one, let's just say it varies. And, we are, and we're very aware in the, um, uh, in, in the context of the Campbell Review that, um, that you need more than that, not just these kind of translations. And, and, and we have a users group that's actually made some effort to have media specialists and, and practitioners translate some of these things and disseminate in ways that, uh, uh, that require a skill set that a lot of authors and researchers don't need, so this, uh, don't have. So this is a, um, 
this is a broader but imp important issue with research synthesis is, um, is, is how not just to do something with the numbers, but how to characterize the findings in a way that's meaningful in the policy context and how to bridge between the research world and the research language and that. And, um, and it's a skill in its own right. And just asking authors to try and write something in common English is a step in the right direction, but not the end of the road by any means. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you know of any examples with large effect sizes that are not of practical significance in international studies? Do I, do I know large uh, examples of large effect sizes that are not of much practical significance? I, I, I do in a general way. I'd, uh, I'd have to work a little to give you an exact cit citation, but, um, uh, but, but here's, here's a kind of a context in which you might uh, uh, have that. Um, in, um, uh, when your outcome is an attitude measure, Attitudes are very easy to push around, um, uh, but there's a very large literature that shows that attitude change does not translate much into behavioral change. So you can, there are whole f families of interventions that are, are capable of, um, uh, I've done some work in character education in schools, for instance, and you give values questionnaires and attitude questionnaires. It doesn't take a really powerful intervention to push uh, attitudes around, pr particularly in the short term, right after the end of some kind of intervention where, where we uh, often measure the, uh, the outcomes and get pretty big effect sizes out of that. Now, depending, again, contextualized, depending on what you're trying to accomplish, the audience, the objectives and so on, that may be an important thing. But at, at one practical level, to what extent does that actually show up in any changed behavior? That, we know that that coupling is, um, uh, is, is very weak and it's not unusual in studies of that sort to see big effect sizes for attitude and very, very small ones for the actual uh, behavioral changes that go with it. So that might be an example. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. I, um, there, there, there's, there's a range. The question is, is, is there variation or range within the same construct? And, and the answer is yes. Maybe not so extreme, but it depends on the domain. Um, um, different outcome measures have different responsivity or sensitivity to uh, intervention. Uh, primary researchers know this. One of the things that I, I've been doing meta-analysis now for as long as I can uh, remember, and there are many frustrating aspects about it. One of the most frustrating aspects in every area where I've worked is how alarmingly creative primary researchers are in selecting their dependent variables. Um, so, I mean, you would think if you were going to be doing science, you'd have some norms and consensus around the best ones and everyone would use those even if they experimented with some others. And there are studies in which the same, I, we can show this in, much, in many of our meta-analyses where there are multiple, out, multiple measures of the same outcome construct. And there are systematic studies, for instance, in areas of medicine with quality of life measures, taking the same intervention and measuring what's presumptively quality of life with different quality of life scales or functional status or any of these uh, uh, things and showing that the different measures give you different effect sizes. Some of them have responded more to that intervention and some of them have responded less. And in the design of primary studies, this is an important uh, aspect. You want to, uh, you, you want a measure that responds to the intervention. You can decide later how practically significant that is, but if it doesn't respond, of course, you don't, you don't know if you're finding nothing because the intervention was ineffective or finding nothing or a small effect because the measure was, uh, was unresponsive. I'll show you some education examples a little later on with these standardized high stakes uh, achievement tests that are being widely given in U.S. schools. They're like big battleships. They're almost impervious to the effects of, uh, of any intervention and very small effects on, on those are the best that anybody can do. And a lot of that is the inherent, not the concept of achievement, but the inherent measurement characteristics of these standardized, highly reliable, highly psychometrized uh, uh, tests that are pretty much developed to measure individual differences, not to measure actual change. And, and, and dynamic things. Um, so there is certainly variation there. I don't know, uh, I don't know how extreme it might be in different contexts between um, alternate measures of what's 
basically the same construct with the same intervention and the same samples being capable of giving you a range of effect sizes. So like a curriculum based measure? Yeah, for example, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, think about just to, uh, this is a little digressive, but the concepts are relevant. I mean, think of the difference in a, uh, in a, in a curric education curriculum context between what a teacher would do at the end of, say, teaching long division uh, to give a mastery test that is very aligned with what was just taught, okay, but doesn't reproduce the same problems the kids did on homework, but the same analogous ones, um, and trying to measure the effects of that teaching um, using the SAT-10 standardized uh, uh, math uh, uh, test, for instance. You would get, uh, in principle, with the, uh, with the mastery test, you could have kids scoring uh, zero with no variation before instruction and 100% with no variation after instruction. The entire dynamic would be change and not individual differences. You go to one of these standardized tests, and you're gonna have a wide range of individual differences and a much smaller degree of change. There are inher inherent characteristics to the measures. And to, to move back to the research synthesis domain, it's smart to pay some attention to the actual measures that are used on the, uh, on the different constructs. I know as some of my crew can, uh, can attest that when we do our coding, we do a lot of coding on the characteristics of those measures. Are they standardized, unstandardized, self-report, uh, so on and so forth, and actually look at those as moderators um, and, and regularly find that a lot of the variation in the effect sizes is associated, for a given outcome construct, is associated with how the researchers decided to measure it not what the actual change was that was being produced by the intervention. And that's a little scary when you think about it. The researchers aren't supposed to, their decisions aren't supposed to be driving what you find. It's supposed to be the intervention that's being studied. So that, that's a whole area that needs a lot more thought and a lot more work. Um, but in the context of research synthesis, where we're gonna have <coughs> typically a variety of these measures uh, because of this creativity and lack of standardization in most of these uh, uh, fields, um, that shows up as heterogeneity, and heterogeneity that may not actually be related to differential intervention effects or different uh, client mixes or anything may be uh, related to uh, what the uh, researchers bring to the situation, not what the thing being studied brings. It, it's, you shouldn't have gotten me started on this, but um, just, <laughs> just, just one more note. Um, it, it's hard when you, when you look at these things systematically with lots of studies. Um, um, it's hard not to be impressed with the differential recognition of the methodological issues that bear on research synthesis. Primary researchers and research synthesis are very sensitive to design issues. Okay, was it randomized? Was there attrition? Is it quasi-experimental? Was there baseline equivalence? And so on. And that's important and plays a role, both in primary studies and synthesis, no doubt about it. But remarkably cavalier about the measurement end of things. Um, and a lot of the analysis we've done shows that more of the variation in the ultimate effect sizes in the meta-analysis is associated with the measurement characteristics than actually with the design characteristics. Now, whether or not it, that's variation that is biasing or not is something that's hard to tell, um, but it's certainly troubling. Okay, I'm glad I got that rant out of my system. <laughs> Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Different ways of measuring what is, is presumptively the same construct. I mean, the question of whether or not it's really the same construct, you know, sort of gets you into a measurement validity area that is not represented in most of these studies. But, but just, just to illustrate, and, and here's a simple example that's not nearly as complex as measuring achievement or something. With the, with the juvenile offenders, where we've done a lot of research, okay, you're interested in the reoffense rate of juvenile offenders. Okay, what could be more straightforward than that? All right, well, it can be measured as whether or not you were rearrested, yes or no. It can be measured as whether or not you were reconvicted, 
yes or no, whether or not you were re-institutionalized, yes or no, or maybe the frequency with which you were re-arrested or reconvicted, or maybe six months after the end of the intervention, or 12 months, or 18 months, or maybe nine and a half months, or maybe a different time for every person depending on when they had the intervention. And all of those effect, influence the, the effect sizes. And that's something as simple as, you know, did, did you re-offend or not? Um, and then you get into areas where the construct, it's, where the thing you're trying to measure itself is not so, you know, concrete and clear, like how much a kid knows about mathematics and it gets even murkier. <laughs> okay? Getting back to the question of, uh, of, of effect sizes, I just want to show you one other common um, distribution overlap. A lot of you will have seen this. Um, I, I don't find it as informative myself as the kind of Cohen's U3 thing, um, um, uh, but it has some nice properties. And this is the Rosenthal and Rubin binomial effect size uh, display, BESD. And they're using the same concept, what proportion are above and uh, below a, a threshold in the treatment group and the control group. Um, but they have set that threshold at the grand median of the two distributions as opposed, uh, as, as compared to the mean of the control distribution, which is what the Cohen index did. Do you see that? So if we think of the whole combined distribution here in the grand median, that red line splits the whole thing into 50-50. Uh, 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 um, and then you can look at the treat control group and the treatment group and see what proportions are on each side of the, the line. And in this particular case, you got 70% of the control group and 30% of the treatment group on the lower end and then the reverse percentages on the, uh, on the upper end, okay? Um, and this is for an effect size of 0.80. Again, this is a little larger than kind of your, your no usual normative distributions, but you squeeze the distributions together too much and you can't see what's, uh, uh, what's going on. The, um, um, uh, the, the, the property of this that makes it interesting but will not be useful in some context but maybe in others is that there's this really tidy relationship between the standardized mean difference effect size, the correlational equivalent of that, and the proportions that are on each side of this uh, grand median. So it really was a rather clever thing for Rosenthal and Rubin to do. What how intuitive it is in different contexts, I, I think, is an open question. But here are some examples. So we take an effect size of standardized mean difference of 0.10. The corresponding correlation coefficient um, is 0.05. Um, and there's a little formula for this, but roughly correlation coefficient uh, versions of standardized mean differences are about half. It's not quite, but, um, depend, but uh, in the approximately about half. And you'll see for the most part that's about right, except it gets, starts varying as you get higher. The, uh, the proportions above and below here are 0.47 and 0.52 for a difference of 5% that have been moved from one to the other. Well, that is the same as that, you see, and that and that and this and this and all the way down, okay? So there's this kind of tidy symmetrical relationship between the statistical effect size expressed as correlations and the proportions uh, that are differentiating how many are above and below this uh, grand median, okay? But these numbers right here are the attempt to illustrate what we were looking at with the Cohen U3. That is, you've got some kind of a threshold here. Um, and in the control group, you've got certain proportions on each side. Uh, and then you have an intervention that moves up that average how those proportions changed as who's above and below that original threshold, okay? And then what, um, uh, what that should take you to um, for situations where uh, it's meaningful is instead of an arbitrary threshold, how about putting a meaningful threshold in there? See, the mean of the control group you know, we kind of know what that is, and it helps think about some, but that's arbitrary. Is being at the mean of the control group, is that dreadful? Is that good? Is that, you know, is that dead? Is that alive? Um, uh, you know, uh, we can see how much better you get proportionately in the uh, treatment group. But it, and similarly, the, the BESD, grand mean, is kind of arbitrary. Um, so, um, um, but, so, but in many situations, we need to think about whether or not there's actually some meaningful threshold to put on the control group distribution that would have more inherent meaning than these. So take, for instance, a, a standardized mean difference effect size of 0.23 for treatment for depression. 
on outcome measures of self-report like the, um, now I'm blocked on the, what's the? The Beck, thank you, the most widely used one, the Beck Depression Inventory, there, there are several of them, on, some, on outcome measures of, of that sort, okay? For many of measures in this domain, um, researchers have actually established thresholds of clinical depression, okay? Would vary from measure to measure, but, uh, but, but there's some credibility behind that. It's often used diagnostically. Um, um, so we might then, um, for at least some subset that use, say, the Beck's depression inventory, which has a clinical threshold. Uh, and again, the question of making sure the one that use the Beck's aren't so different than the ones that don't. We might index this back in terms of the change in the distributions as a function of what proportion are clinically depressed versus not clinically depressed. You following me? Um, so uh, if we determined from that uh, subset that the average proportion of the control group in the clinical range was, say, 64%, and we're doing this just by looking at the data from the control groups, okay? Now we ask ourselves if we have an effect size of 0.23, what are the proportions that are clinically depressed? How much reduction have we gotten in the proportion clinically depressed with that much of an intervention effect, okay? Um, so again, you know, if we, if, if we know or can assume normal distribution, we can go, we can go to the uh, table of uh, areas under the uh, uh, normal curve and find that. Uh, so, this is, so this is basically the picture of that, okay? Um, so we've got the uh, control distribution and the uh, intervention distribution, and um, it's a little subtle here, but you can see that the uh, intervention distribution has moved downward um, in this particular case. Um, we've got our success threshold that is defined here now in terms of something like the clinical level on, on a representative uh, uh, scale uh, and the proportions above and, uh, and below. Uh, so if we go to our, um, um, uh, our, our normal uh, table again, we range down for the uh, z-scores until we find 64% who are clinically depressed, right, to the left of our threshold and actually to the right if you have scores where higher scores are more depressed. Okay, but on the clinically de uh, depressed side. And now we want to know uh, what proportion have moved as a result of an intervention that reduced depression by an effect size of 0.23. So I'm going to add, I went the wrong way. No, no, I'm going to subtract in this case because um, I, I want fewer people to be clinically depressed. That's the humane way to approach this. <laughs> um, so I'm going to take my 0.36 and remember the, the Z's are standard deviation units, so our effect size of 0.23, we'll subtract that, so we'll range around on the table and find the 0.13 range, and now we got 55%, okay? So this effect size of 0.23 has um, uh, taken a control group in which 64% were clinically depressed and improved the overall depression rate so that now only 55, only, he said, 55% are clinically depressed. You see? So, and, and, and the idea is the meaningful threshold, not particularly uh, these numbers. And there are many contexts um, uh, in education, uh, our, um, our national um, uh, NAEP education test, the, uh, uh, the researchers who developed that have worked out some thresholds on these different scores for what's the level of basic reading and proficient reading and, uh, and, and so on. Um, uh, there, there are a number of contexts in which there are sort of some meaningful breakpoints in, uh, in some of these measures. Uh, we get effect size results, but thinking in distributional terms, you can talk about how many percent, what percent were above that success threshold in the control group and how many more are above it uh, as a result of the intervention. And again, same numbers, simple transformation with some, in this case, some distributional assumptions into just a different set of numbers, uh, but numbers that are easier to grasp in terms of what this might actually um, mean as a, as a, a practical, um, practical value. And what did I do with, oh, well, that's just a picture of the same thing. Okay. Um, so. If we think about what the effect sizes we're working with actually mean, uh, how they're constructed, uh, stand, uh, they're in standard deviation units, they're a phi coefficient, they're a, an odds ratio, um, and uh, have some understanding of the context of the intervention and what might be a more interpretable representation of that, um, it's almost always possible to take the, the, the data at hand and find some transformation 
uh, depending on the nature of the outcomes, the intervention, what's available, uh, some kind of transformation that will put that number in a form that's going to be a little more intuitively understandable with regard to what it might what its actual magnitude and practical meaning might be. Again, we're just making it easier for common sense and intuitions, or in sometimes, in some cases, more informed intuitions for a clinical group or a, or a teacher group or a, a school counselor group that might be the relevant uh, audience. Oops, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, James. Um, so, what, from what you've talked about so far, you seem to be uh, methods of, of helping the, your, your, the audience for your research build intuition about what you've done. Right. right? Um, but there's, a, there's another use for meta-analysis, which is to make, make predictions about the use of this intervention in the future. In the center, right? That's presumably why people are reading your research, right? Um, well. Yeah, maybe. Mm -hmm. say, yeah. Say, you know, say a, a district superintendent wants to know should I implement this program or not. Ah, yeah. Right? Um, they want to know well, how big an effect should I expect if mm -hmm. I implement this in my district. Um, so, I'm, uh, what you what you showed us is it seems like it's uh, there is a danger that by translating translating your findings into more intuitive terms, you're also making them less relevant for, for purposes of prediction. Right? Because uh, I guess I'm not. Uh, so are we making things less relevant for prediction? Prediction in the sense of sort of generalization to the situation in which one might want to implement the thing that the systematic review reviewed. Right. How is, a, how is a, a school superintendent um, better able to decide if this intervention is useful with an effect size of 0.15 than knowing that, um, uh, that it moved 20% uh, of the kids' vocabulary scores uh, above the, where they would have been, the average uh, they would have been before? I, I, but, uh, I mean, the, re the reason regularity or more homogeneity on that scale across uh, applications of intervention, right? Uh, we, think, we think that that's the, that's the right intervention measure in order to, to take an average and, and synthesize. Yeah, so, I, I, I would put that another way, though. I mean, if, if, if every study um, used the same outcome measure, we don't need effect size indicator yeah. indices. We're using the effect size indi uh, indices to produce a standardized metric that we believe has somewhat similar, represents somewhat similar magnitude of change uh, irrespective of the way the construct was actually uh, measured, right? So it's a, it's a convenience, that uh, more than a convenience, a necessity for allowing us to pool the results of studies that use different measures of the same construct. I, I, I guess I'm not, I'm not seeing how, um, how, how then translating that into more intuitive form would inhibit um, any other use of those results. Right. Right. Well, but if the if the if the superintendent's district was particularly low performing, then that uh, the oh then then then, then th yeah that it it might not it might not apply and that superintendent might not get that effect uh, uh, using that uh, program, but the impl I mean think I think the implication uh, 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 that's true in any event and that. That takes us into generalizability and some other things we might do that go beyond what we're doing here. But the alternative of not making that translation seems to me that amounts to saying, um, um, let's obscure the expected effect so that the superintendent won't realize that he or she didn't actually attain it. Uh, and that just doesn't seem to me to be a good logic, right? Well, you know, 
Well, that's fair enough. I think there, there's not necessarily a best answer here. And depending on the circumstances, I can easily say, if you think about it this way, here's, you know, here's what it would look like. And if you think about it this other way, here's how it would look like to, to, to better inform your reader. No, no, no. I don't want to go there. Uh, it, it, that, it, it, it's, it, the, the question of the applicability of these results to any context, okay, is, is very important. I don't mean that it's not. But, but it goes beyond interpreting the practical significance of the particular findings you have in a particular uh, research synthesis. And there's a, a lot of interesting things to be said about. You probably worked on this, and I know Larry's working on the question of generalizability and, and matching. And, and that's an important business. But that takes us into another domain that says, you know, we have this finding in our research synthesis. What's the likelihood or what's the variant on that that would apply in your context? And what are the characteristics of your context that are different from the characteristics in which this was developed? And those are important considerations. But I don't see that as being closely connected with the simple question of how well we're communicating what the, the findings were of that original synthesis. We can we can talk we can we can talk about this this later. I'm not I'm not meaning to say that's unimportant. I think it's just a, 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 a different issue, uh, an important one, but a different issue. Um, yeah. Another question. Um, many of the examples that you're talking about really require the are based on the assumption that non-distribution scores. Yeah. Right. No, and there'd be no, and there would be no, there would be no reason in many contexts, depending on what you know. Th there's nothing about the logic here that says it has to be a normal distribution. Makes it real easy to look things up on the uh, on the normal uh, table. Um, but if you have access to data, say you have very skewed achievement measures, and you have access to the to the uh, archival records for the school dis uh, for a particular school district or some representative national data set, uh, or you have good reason to believe, I was talking about arrest rates and so on, they t tend to follow a Poisson distribution. I might, I might presume it's Poisson, I may not have the exact version, but that's closer than normal, and I can do all the same things, I just have to kind of go to a more complex formula or a different table to find out what the proportions are. I, I, so I, it's a good point. There's, there's, I'm giving examples, but they don't require that you assume normality. But if you're not, then you need some information about what you should assume and what those distributions are going to look like that you may get from various sources. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Does it matter if you have a fixed or a random effects model? Um, I'd have to think about that, but off the top of my head, I don't think so. Uh, in, in, for the particular issue we're talking about now, uh, for the following reason, whatever decision you make about the model is driven by something else other than how you're going to decide to dis describe the effect sizes. The question of which model is appropriate. Now, you're going to get, uh, in many instances, um, uh, uh, you're going to get different average effect sizes, for instance, from those uh, uh, different models. You know, but assuming it's the model that makes sense is, is appropriate, then that is your estimate of the effect size. And at that point, we're simply talking really about how to better communicate that. Certainly, if if you've done an inappropriate statistical analysis or made an error or use a model that really doesn't apply to the situation and then you then translate that effect size, it's, it's misleading. But I think the issue comes not with regard to what we're doing here with the, what we take to be our best estimate of the effect size. That kind of goes to the question of the steps necessary to get the best estimate of the effect size, uh, which again it, you know, is an important topic, but, but, I, but I think not directly connected with the translation issue. Clearly, if you translate um, uh, uh, any statistical estimate when the statistical estimate is erroneous to begin with, uh, 
you're not gaining anything with a translation that makes it more intuitive. I kind of like the implication that there would be situations where we would deliberately not do that in order to, order to obscure what the actual uh, meaningful expectation might be for a given intervention, but I have to think about situations for that. Let me, um, let me show you some examples of more direct assess attempts to do more direct assessment of, of uh, uh, practical significance before we uh, run out of uh, time. And the fundamental concept here that differs from the simple descriptive tr um, translation is that here you're going to have another frame, another, a criterion or set of standards or framework <coughs> Uh, for thinking about practical significance that is in the context of the practical domain of application. And then you're going to try and move your effect size into that domain and, uh, and, and see how it relates to some kind of criteria, standards, uh, uh, framework that have some intrinsic uh, uh, meaning as opposed to just descriptively uh, uh, going from one set of numbers to a more intuitive set of uh, numbers. So this requires some kind of criterion uh, um, from the context of, uh, of application. There are going to be many possibilities here, um, uh, and in some cases perhaps where there are no possibilities, um, uh, so there's definitely not a right answer. So again, some things to help you think about this um, for different uh, situations. Um, so, uh, uh, so just to repeat, the numerical value of what comes out of our synthesis uh, in terms of average effect sizes and any of the other indicators is not going to take us uh, directly there. Um, so. Um, uh, uh, actually, the, the clinical, uh, to back up a minute to that last point that, that just disappeared, uh, we were actually taking a step in this direction when we were looking at things like the clinical threshold. Um, yeah, for, uh, for depression. Now we're taking something from that context, the clinical context, putting it into our effect size distribution. So that's, that's a step closer to what I'm talking about here is, to, is, is actually uh, bridging. Um, but here are some, um, uh, here's some other kind of criterion frameworks that would work in um, some situations. And I'm going to use education examples uh, to illustrate these um, uh, you know, for no other reason than the fact that um, the work I've been doing on thinking about this recently has been uh, in that context, so these are the handy examples, but I think that um, I think the concept uh, extends uh, um, beyond that. So um, normative expectations for change, um, what others have found with similar measures and similar interventions and how yours compare, closing policy relevant performance gaps, cost, Oh, that says not discussed here. That's not true. I'm actually going to give you a brief example of that. Um, so it is going to be discussed here. Um, uh, and, and, but these are, these are just illustrations. The, the, the potential here um, very much depends on the context of application and what has practical significance there for your particular situations. But, uh, but again, just some, some things to stimulate thought. So we can think about benchmarking against uh, normative explanation, uh, expectations for uh, change. So here's an example. Uh, Howard Bloom and I and some colleagues did this uh, some years ago, compiled uh, from national norms of um, achievement tests. Um, uh, uh, and actually seven tests that, uh, uh, that we looked at here. Um, and what we looked at was the, um, we turned into effect sizes. So here's the basic concept. You, you take something that's sort of meaningful in the practical world and you try and put it in effect size terms so you can compare your effect sizes with it. You see the difference between just translating your effect size. We're, we're, we're trying to make the bridge back the other way. So what we did uh, in this case was to look uh, on these standardized, on these big standardized tests that are widely used for school reform outcomes and, uh, and, and so on. Um, what is the effect size equivalent of the difference between the grades. Um, so from going from grade two to grade three, you've got all the educational experience, all the real world experience, all the natural development, okay? And anybody in the educational context has some sense of how much better the average third grader, fourth grader, fifth grader performs uh, uh, than, the, than the, the grades between. So, um, uh, you know, so there's an indication of sort of year to year change with everything thrown in there. Okay, uh, in the developmental sequence. Now we have an intervention, okay, that accelerates that change by how much? 
has your intervention increased the natural developmental process of uh, whatever what of the skill development in a year by five percent, ten percent, fifteen percent? So we're essentially benchmarking against what we think is a, a, a sort of a normative uh, developmental trajectory. And if you do that. Um, um, what we found is something like uh, this. Um, reading, math, science, social studies, each of these is the effect size from kindergarten to first grade, first grade to second grade, and so on, do you see? Um, uh, so for reading, for instance, the first thing to notice is um, depending on what grade level you're working with, a given effect size on these kinds of measures would mean something quite different. A point one five, remember I used that example when I started, would not be a very big acceleration of the enormous gain kids, uh, younger kids are making on the range of a standard deviation or more from year to year. You get up here in high school though, where everybody seems to be pretty much brain dead as far as these, uh, <laughs> as these particular measures are concerned, and a .15 is coming close to doubling, okay, the, uh, the, the, the achievement that's made over that period of time, all right? Now, whether or not you think this is meaningful for a particular context is not necessarily the, the, uh, the point. In some contexts it would be, in other contexts uh, uh, maybe not. But you see what we're trying to do, okay? We've got something that has some recognizable meaning in an educational context, what kids are, are, are how they're progressing developmentally from year to year with all the input that comes from family and, and, and context and school and everything else. And we're using that as a framework to kind of benchmark what it might mean to have an effect size of a given value. And we're doing that by taking this developmental sequence and translating um, the, the, the measures that index that into effect size units so we can compare kind of apples with apples, our intervention effect sizes with comparable metric uh, uh, for year to year gains. And here's another uh, illustration um, that, that, that comes from our own work and this is actually from a, a, a primary study but the same thing could be done at the uh, meta-analytic level. Um, what we've done here is to um, think about ch um, change from pretest to post-test. Now this, these are things that would make sense in a developmental context where there is a change. So you could go into your meta-analysis with some of the common measures like a PPVT or something and look uh, over the, over the pretest, post-test period of your intervention, how much pretest, post-test uh, change is there? That's your developmental process for the control group. So that's essentially the natural development for the control group without the intervention. Here's the pre-post change in effect size units, an effect size of 0.31, okay, that's the intervention effect size. What does that mean in terms of how much it has improved the, the natural development that would have occurred uh, uh, otherwise? And that's about a 38% increase in acceleration by about 38% of the, of the learning from beginning to end over this period, okay? Um, so we're coming, Again, we're indexing against a, a developmental trajectory that would characterize the situation without intervention and asking relative to that how much of uh, an increase or an acceleration do we see. Um, uh, here's another um, example that um, we're, we're trying to update this because you have, um, but this is something uh, 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 that works well in a meta-analytic context. But we put together, um, Oh goodness. Um, we, we put together effect sizes for different kinds of achievement measures from all the randomized studies we could find in education that had achievement outcomes. So this is kind of the Jacob Cohen uh, uh, norming concept, except we're norming for a particular kinds of measures in a particular kind of context, educational interventions with uh, achievement measures. And, and you can kind of see why something as broad as the Cohen um, uh, uh, standards uh, don't apply here. But first, if you look at the mean effect sizes uh, from these various randomized studies for elementary school, for uh, middle school, uh, for high school, you see that there are different, um, uh, different averages at the different schools. But look at the order of magnitude of this. This is kind of the average of a whole lot of different kind of interventions that produce uh, effect sizes. If, if you start out with my original effect size of, uh, of 0.15, Okay, that's kind of in the lower um, in in the lower range of the overall average that uh, that general educational interventions uh, t seem to be producing. Uh, what's a little more interesting 
here, I think, is look at the difference between your broadband achievement measures. These are your overall reading measures, uh, kind of like state uh, measures. Uh, your more specialized tests, this might be like a subtest of vocabulary or fluency uh, under a, a reading heading. Um, and, the, um, uh, and the researcher developed or teacher developed uh, test here. Um, the effect size is if you're, if you're doing a uh, research synthesis on achievement outcomes where most of them are using these broadband tests, the average um, uh, is less than one-tenth of a standard deviation in terms of effect sizes. If that's the kind of measure you're talking about, that 0.15 I used as an example at the very beginning is well above the, uh, uh, the effects that most of these interventions are getting. Uh, now, that may be good or bad, but it kind of tells you what's the best anybody's been able to do so far that shows up in rigorous studies. Um, are, you, are you outperforming at least the average of what other interventions have been able to do moving this important uh, outcome? And, and, and so on down the line. So here we're, we're benchmarking against norms, but we're trying to find norms that are appropriate for the particular kind of outcome measures and the particular kind of context uh, and the, and the uh, interventions. Um, uh, and this is, um, now we kind of break out, this is kind of interesting, um, uh, the different kinds of, um, of, uh, of interventions. Those that are more like tutoring that focus on individual students, uh, small groups, uh, pull-out programs mostly, whole classrooms and whole school interventions. And you can see we don't have that many effect sizes in some categories, but you can see the, uh, the nature. If you're doing a whole school intervention and you get a small Jacob Cohen effect size of 0.20, uh, the average of what everybody's been able to do with whole school interventions is 0.10. That's pretty much a knock your socks off whole school intervention effect size. On the other hand, if that's the effect size you have for a tutoring program, that's in the low end of what other people have been able to get on similar measures out of tutoring programs. You see what we're doing here in terms of trying to get uh, uh, connected at least with you know, what's the state of the art with intervention, and is our effect size showing that we're that, 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 that we've got something that's that's at least better than the average that's already out there, or worse? Um, policy relevant uh, demographic um, uh, gaps. Here is the effect size translation of the well-known uh, black, white, and Hispanic, white, and um, uh, and socioeconomic uh, uh, status uh, differentials from, um, uh, these are actually from SAT 9 scores from a couple of large urban uh, school districts. And you can see um, you're running in a, the range of a standard deviation here and a little less there. So if we have an intervention that is targeted on minority students or low SES students, and we have an effect size of say 0.25, we can characterize that in terms of how far it goes in terms of closing this uh, policy relevant gap. If we had effect sizes in the range of one, we, you know, that would be knock your socks off in terms of, uh, of something that has the potential to close that gap. An effect size of 0.2 is moving in that direction, but it's leaving a lot of room still um, in terms of where you would like to have uh, the effects of that intervention on that, uh, on that population. Um, uh, one other example, um, uh, Larry Hedges actually came up with this, and then Howard, uh, Howard Bloom and his colleagues kind of adapted it to some data we had on hand. But we actually uh, estimated uh, with some controls for type of uh, students, what is, in effect size units, what's the difference between the average achievement test for um, low scoring schools and uh, high score, high, uh, average schools actually? And here, what do we have? The 50th percentile school, uh, so that's the average school, and the 10 percentile school, okay? So if you want to close the whole school gap, okay, what kind of effect sizes do you need? And actually, um, at the whole school level, these are remarkably small. So a whole school intervention that produces an effect size of 0.2, that's pretty much equivalent of taking one of these 10 percentile schools in terms of their performance and moving them up to the, uh, uh, to the average for this particular uh, school district. But again, you see the logic here. You know, we're looking for <coughs> frameworks that have policy and practical meaning. Finding a way with regard to the measures and, and constructs we're interested in to represent that practical meaning in effect size units, and then we've got a benchmark against which we can compare the effect size unit we get out of our uh, a metric we get out of our uh, synthesis. Can you go back just to, to I'm not sure I can. Um, yeah, but that would be too easy. <laughs> that grade 
mm -hmm. backside. Yeah. So I could interpret that to say that an effect size of 0.07 um, of an intervention would take a one of the schools in the 10th percentile and have the likelihood of moving it to the for the 10th graders, the 10th yeah. Grade. But remember what I showed you with those developmental trajectories, you know. Not much going on in the 10th grade in terms of achievement uh, gain. So, you know, so small effects there in a context where um, you don't have that much difference in schools and you don't have that much year-to-year -year gain going on even normatively, okay. It means a whole lot, I mean, that's the point, you know. It means a whole lot more when you contextualize it and, and benchmark it that way than if you just took it as a number. And certainly if you took it as a Jacob Cohen, you know. He would say it's not yeah. at all significant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, I, and, and, and I'm not trying to sell any of these frameworks. I'm trying to get you to think about what might be the framework in your context that has inherent practical meaning. And is there a way to get some data or the way to represent that in effect size terms that give you some criteria against which you can benchmark then uh, the estimates for the uh, uh, intervention effects against that that would uh, that, that, w that would tell you, um, uh, give you some fairly direct indication of the practical significance by those standards. Now, just this is the last one. Um, um, this this I can't talk about this very um, extensively in this uh, context, but there's hardly anything in most contexts that means more in the policy world than dollars, or. Norwegian crowns or British pounds or, you know, whatever your, your, uh, your preferred uh, uh, currency is here. Um, uh, um, and this is an example from Steve Oss's work. Steve Oss was going to present tomorrow as one of our panels and unfortunately won't make it because he came down with the flu. Um, but they have done very interesting work. Here we, I've just pulled out of, uh, from this uh, reference. Uh, these are intervention programs for your juvenile offenders, my favorite uh, intervention topic. Um, uh, and he's, and um, these are different uh, kinds of interventions. Um, he's basically done a meta-analysis. These are the number of programs. These are the effect sizes. The minus is actually good in this case because it means you've reduced uh, delinquency. Um, you know, so diversion with services, the average effect size over 13 studies is minus 0.0. 5, okay? Uh, and the biggest one on here is 0.17, all right? At a numerical level, these don't exactly look like knock your socks off things, but remember what I showed you about little effect sizes and reoffense rates and so on. Uh, they have gone the step in their context of figuring out what the cost per person is to deliver these programs. Um, and then they have a very large database, and other people have done work like this too. My colleague Mark Cohen at Vanderbilt has done a lot of work on the cost effectiveness, the cost of crime, community costs, law enforcement costs, court costs, and so on. So if you reduce, um, if you reduce the offending rate by a certain proportion, there are already frameworks within which you can estimate what the what the numeric what the um, uh, what the cost savings are at, uh, at, at dif uh, different uh, uh, levels. Um, and what they have done then is to essentially take the cost of the programs and compare them with the cost of the um, uh, of the uh, benefits. And you can see in many cases the uh, the, the benefit the the monetary value of the benefits far outweighs the cost. Uh, where, what the, where they go on with this is to actually do some cost-benefit ratios. And some of these programs are fairly effective in terms of reducing reoffense rates, but fairly expensive. And other programs that have smaller effect sizes, but cost much less, are actually much more cost effective because they produce much larger benefits. And that's a, a, still a different frame of uh, practical significance here, and one that's often meaningful in uh, policy context. One of the things we would love to see um, in research synthesis, um, but first it has to occur in primary studies, is a lot more reporting of unit costs of the interventions that are being studied. So we could at least say something about what these interventions that we're synthesizing effects for actually cost. And then you can actually bring in some of these exter this external economic work on, uh, on, on the, um, the monetary implications of various outcomes, uh, mental health, uh, showing up being, having to be treated in, uh, on an inpatient basis, for instance, in mental health, or being unemployed, uh, uh, or, or crime. There are a lot of these things where there are already cost frameworks for what the cost to society is of poor outcomes there.
Uh, all we really need is to pull together the cost data and the effect sizes to uh, make, um, uh, make cost estimates uh, for um, the, the cost benefit or cost effectiveness relationships of the interventions. And we're in an almost guaranteed context of, uh, of practical significance. Oh, yeah, I did all that. These are just some examples. So, in conclusion, everything I just said. <laughs> We've, <laughs> we've run over, thanks for your uh, uh, patience, but the plenary doesn't start till three, so you still have 15 minutes uh, um, uh, break. Um, I appreciate the fact that you spent some of it on the tail end of this. <laughs>